it's an extremely rare document. But it uh, is patterned after the African Methodist Episcopal Doctrine and Disciplines. And there are portions of that in which uh, Seymour talks about the kind of the history of Azusa Street from his perspective. It's very uh, short to that, uh, to that point. But one of the things that he does say is ultimately that nobody can hold office in that church who is not a person of color. And the reason he gives is because uh, at that particular time, while there were some white folks who had been loyal to the Azusa Street Mission right on up till 1915, the vast majority had caused some major problems. And so as a result, uh, he then established a, really a black church. How did he get blinded in that eye? Did, was he born that way? or? No, I think it was a result of a smallpox infection that he had had uh, early on in life. Did he wear a patch over it? Or? Uh, no, I believe he had a glass eye, uh, but uh -huh. I don't remember ever seeing or hearing anything about a patch. Uh -huh. Tall man, big man? Uh, about six feet, uh, maybe as short as five foot ten. I have his death certificate. I should probably take a look and see if that really? says anything, but huh. uh, he died of heart heart problems. We're well, showing that picture early. right now of the uh, the tombstone on his grave. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, so that that's very interesting uh -huh. there. Buried where? He's in Evergreen Cemetery in uh, uh, really on the east side of downtown Los Angeles. There are a number of early Pentecostal and holiness leaders that are buried there. I think it's, it's uh, fascinating, for instance, that uh, C.P. Jones, we sing a lot yeah. of his songs yes. as well, is uh, buried there just within a few feet of him, uh, maybe a hundred feet or so. And uh, C.P. Jones was, uh, was bypassed in the Pentecostal revival in the Church of God in Christ. He was one of the co-founders along with Charles Mason. And when Mason became Pentecostal and the Church of God in Christ uh, became Pentecostal, C.P. Jones formed uh, the Congregational Holiness Church. Uh, Phineas Brzee, the founder of the Nazarene uh, Church, is also buried in that cemetery. Mm. So, be quite a place when the resurrection takes yes, place. Yes, I think so. Uh, how old was uh, Seymour when he died? Um, I would have to look that up, but I think he was in his mid-50s. Mid-50s? Mm -hmm. Very young. Yes, quite young. I uh, want you to give me, uh, in brief form, the strengths. Well, first, let's start with the weaknesses, and then the strengths of the early Azusa Street Revival. I know we've talked about some of these things, mm -hmm. but I, I just like to hear it from the top. Uh, from the top. <laughs> uh, weaknesses are hard to uh, figure out. I think uh, one of the weaknesses is that there was no one there to help them, to nurture them, to tell them, this is the way we do it. There was a good deal of trial and error, and sometimes uh, when you have trial and error method, you, you, you do run into major problems. And I'm sure that there were, there were cases of wildfire. In fact, one Baptist preacher uh, said that it was a combination of African voodoo religion and Caucasian insanity that was going on down there at Azusa Street. And that was printed up in the newspaper. Well, I read it's, there that some said that they were supposed to leave their wives or their husbands. And well, it was uh, proposed. I don't know whether it's true. Or yeah, not. I'm not quite sure that those uh, Okay, go ahead and tell me any more witnesses. Those were true, but certainly that was one. Um, I suppose um, uh, another weakness is that you do have very strong personalities in these early years of the Pentecostal movement. And sometimes those personalities got on edge with one another, and as a result, splits developed along personality lines. Uh, and I think that uh, Bartleman is a, a great example. I think that Fisher might be somewhat of an example uh, of people that split out of Azusa Street or First New Testament Church to form their own, uh, in part simply because they needed a place for themselves to be the key kind of person. But I think they also lost a, a good deal of the uh, egalitarian nature, the equality of what was going on here, because this was a, a, a strength, sh should I say, of this mission was the fact that everybody had something that they could bring. It could be a poem, it could be a song, it could be a testimony. Uh, women got up there and read scripture, some of them preached, uh, and people listened, and uh, pe uh, men and women, black and white, you know, they were down there working uh, the altars, or they were upstairs in the prayer room where they were seeking for the baptism in the spirit. Uh, they were going out and they were holding uh, street meetings, and men and women went together, and it, it was uh, very egalitarian in, in, in its day. So that was a, a major strength. And I think we have to remember that many of these people were poor, um, downtrodden, and there are issues of power that I think are involved here as well. I think these people were cut off from the basic power structures of society. Uh, they were poor, uh, they were uneducated, and, and so forth. Um, but ultimately they turned to God for the power that they wanted, and they were rewarded in that. Now I want to ask you some of the uh, positive aspects uh, 
of the uh, charismatic movement, or not the charismatic, the classic, yeah. the Azusa Street Revival. <clears throat> Well, and I think uh, one of the positive things was the kind of desperation that people had for God. Uh, I, I remember as a kid uh, growing up with a little plaque on my wall uh, which said, uh, uh, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. And I think the desperation of these people to touch God and to experience the power of God was a very positive thing because I think ultimately God rewarded uh, they're seeking after him. There's something about being touched by the power of God which makes you, I think, a credible witness in a way that never has been done before. Uh, when you've been touched to the depth of uh, some of these people, that meant that you could go just about anywhere. And so there was this expectancy that when they had been touched, they would be witnesses indeed throughout the world. And that was the kind of thing that sent them uh, to the jails in Whittier, or uh, they went on out to Monrovia where uh, people were accusing them of sacrificing their children. Uh, simply, really? simply, Yeah, simply because of a sermon that uh, uh, um, Glenn Cook had preached out there on Abraham and his son Isaac and on that whole sacrifice issue. And they, as a result, uh, I think they got a great deal of uh, publicity, most of it negative to begin with, but it also attracted people who really wanted to know what is going on with these people. They were willing to pay a price. They were willing, in essence, to be martyred for their faith. And as a result, I think a great deal of good seed was sown uh, in the process. You have been driven in your studies. Uh, <laughs> to be obsessed to know these people like uh, you were living with them. Uh, their names are so familiar. What really got you into this study? Well, I've grown up in the Pentecostal tradition all my life and uh, have uh, been at home with uh, the experience and the people and the church. And they're my people. And in essence, I think uh, about 20 years ago, I was touched with a uh, need to look back at my roots and ask, what was it that uh, got these people going? Uh, how, did they, how did they come at it? What did they learn? Is there anything we can learn from them afresh? And I began to research in earnest about 15 years ago, uh, gathering these names, interviewing people, and, and a whole variety of things. And ultimately, I find myself about uh, ready to write this book on the Azusa Street Mission. We're waiting for that book, too. Uh, I'm, I am, I, too. I, I'm very excited I, about I, it. I just appreciate <laughs> the privilege of being able to sit here with you and feeling that same Holy Spirit all through these years, it hasn't changed, it's the same Holy Spirit. And how many would you say today have had that same experience in the Holy Spirit, would you? Well, I, I read some statistics even earlier this morning, uh, not in preparation, but something in the neighborhood of 382 million people worldwide currently identify with the Pentecostal or charismatic renewal. Now, I don't know how valid those figures are, but even if you were only to say half of that, I think it's a direct result. Would you result. say this is one of the greatest revivals of the last hundred years? There's no question about it. I think uh, that uh, God has been very, very um, generous in, in touching people's hearts as a result of this revival. Where do you think this is going? I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, I think it's going to go on till the end. Uh, uh, you know, we keep talking, uh, Peter Wagner talks about second and third waves now. I'm not sure I want to buy into that thesis, but the fact is I think God is continuing to bless and to touch. I think we're going to find uh, continuing revival, especially in the so-called third world, in Latin America and in, uh, and in Africa. I think there are enormous numbers of peoples that are being reached at this point in time, and I, I expect that to continue to go for quite some time. I think what a blessed privilege it is to have a professor teaching students that are going to pastor our churches in this truth that we had and we've heard today and it's been a joy to sit here with you and share. Oh, thank you very much. I've appreciated the opportunity. I want to talk to you tonight about Azusa again. Will there be another Azusa? Will there be another Pentecost? Well, I'm hearing all of you say yes. Amen. Well, it's exciting to think about God who doesn't change. It's wonderful to know the same Holy Spirit's alive today. But let me say this to you. There will never be another day of Pentecost like it was in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. You say, why? Because it was a day when God said, this is when I'm going to launch the outpouring. 
The Bible says it was a feast day. The word Pentecost means 50, 50 days after the Passover. So on that particular day, not because they were praying for 10 days. You know, I know some people think if you get people pray 10 days, you'd get it. But I'm saying to you that it was God's time. God has a timetable. He's on schedule today. And Azusa was promised by the Lord. It was a special day. There were circumstances at Azusa. God had created a vacuum. There was a hunger. I don't believe you're going to see exactly the same thing happen, but you're going to see the principles of power exactly the same. So I want to talk to you a moment tonight about the principles of power, of how it happened at Zeus' Street, because God is doing the very same thing again. Well, you know how very simple it was on the day of Pentecost? In Acts chapter 2, and you probably ought to take your Bibles and turn to the second chapter of Acts. It was a very, very simple setting. I've been there to the upper room in Jerusalem, and I have seen this simple little room. In fact, one of our deacons was baptized in the Holy Spirit on our last trip that we made there. And the Bible says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all the disciples were there, and they all came to do one thing, to receive the promise of the Father. You see, in the 24th chapter of Luke, verse 49, Jesus said these words, Go ye out into the city of Jerusalem and tarry until ye be endued with power from on high. He led them out as far as to Bethany, lifted up his hands and blessed them. He was parted from them, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Now, that's the way the Gospel of Luke ends. Well, it picks up almost the same in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, watch it very carefully. You see, Jesus had some very important words he was going to give to his disciples. The most important words that a person would give are his parting words. If you were going to leave on a trip, and you said to your loved one, well, I'm going to be going, don't you think those last words would be important? You know the last words of John Wesley is, are the best of all God is with us. George Washington, the father of American democracy, said, it is well. Well, Jesus left his last words, and his last words were these, go and tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. He has told us to do this. They went to the upper room. They went to Jerusalem, and the promise of the Father was fulfilled. Look at it. And they were there waiting when that day came, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. They were sitting. And then it says, There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon them, and they were all filled, not just some. You know, I believe it's God's will that everybody receive the gift of the Spirit. I think I'll always remember my trip over in Georgia when a district superintendent came right here to Melody Land and wanted to know what it was that this congregation had. And uh, he, he followed me around all week, and I didn't know what he was wanting. And he came up and he said, Ralph, he said, there are a few Methodist preachers that are hungry. Would you come over and talk to them? And I said, I'll pay my way. And I went to Georgia, to Atlanta. They'd already had two sessions on the Holy Spirit that night. But God told me something. When I stepped up to the front, he said, you have seven minutes to tell us what you're going to speak on tomorrow morning. And just as clear as anything, it said this to me. God spoke to me and said, in the next seven minutes, I'm going to baptize all of these Methodist preachers with the Holy Spirit. You know what the headlines of the paper read that following Saturday? In the church page, right at the very top of this Atlanta Journal, it said, 150 Methodist preachers received the Holy Spirit just like John Wesley received it. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? All of them were baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was a tremendous night. And I believe God wants all of us filled tonight with the Holy Spirit. And you that are watching, God's given you a promise. The promise is unto you and to your children afar off. Even as many as the Lord, God shall call. And you are going to receive the Holy Spirit. These next few moments, I expect God to fill every person with the Holy Spirit. So they all were filled, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the second setting of Scripture that's very interesting is in the eighth chapter of Acts, where Simon the sorcerer, the magician, offered money. 
that upon whomsoever he should lay his hands, they would receive the Holy Spirit. I want you to know this revival of Azusa was word-centered. It was a Bible revival. If you know anything about Azusa, and you've heard it here, they were studying the Bible. They were reading the Bible. Whatever we believe, we must have the Bible behind it. How many of you know it's the Word of God that produces faith? So they were reading the Word of God, and out of the Word sprang that faith that they needed to receive. And also I would say that it's a movement without a man because it really wasn't anything that any one man did. God used Elder Seymour. God used many others. But I'm telling you, folk, it was really a sovereign act of the Holy Spirit. God, do it again. Everybody say, God, do it again. Well, we go to the eighth chapter, and this magician offered money. What did he see? He really saw something that convinced him of the reality of the Holy Spirit. Eighth chapter of Acts here, you, you'll read that when Paul, or rather when Saul was converted and he had this wonderful experience, he had a d dynamic experience, but the Word of God says in the 14th verse, or 16th verse, for as yet the Holy Spirit had fallen upon none of them, they were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, so he laid his hands upon them, and they received it, and he saw through the laying on of hands. Now, you're going to find out in this brief word that I'm going to give you tonight, there are three biblical ways to receive the Holy Spirit. First one, spontaneously. I like what this man said on the film, that literally the Holy Spirit fell. Reverend Catholic said it fell out in the audience, and it can fall on you while I'm talking tonight. Faith can come in your heart right while you're sitting there. You can open up your spirit and begin to worship the Lord, begin to praise the Lord. God can fill you with the Holy Ghost right now. I believe that. I said, I believe that. I said, I believe that. It was while I was talking to those Methodist preachers, the Holy Ghost fell. We didn't lay hands on them. They just suddenly began to receive. God is a sovereign God. He's the baptizer. How many of you know the Lord Jesus is the one that gives the Holy Spirit? You got to get your eyes on Him. He's the one that's going to give you the Holy Spirit. Now, it says here that they laid hands on him. Doesn't say they spoke with tongues here. We believe it's circumstantial. And that's why I take the position you may speak with tongues, but you don't have to speak with tongues. Isn't it wonderful you get to, but you don't have to? Are you hearing me? You don't have to do anything but die. But how many of you know God lets us do it? It's the privilege of prayer. See, I don't believe you put it on the coercive level and say you must do this or you must do that. Because I found out a lot of times people receive the Holy Spirit after I pray for them, and uh, they may not have some of these evidences or some of these outpourings until later. And I don't worry about that. I think the thing we need to do is please God, worship God. But we've had them to receive, and maybe a week later they'd be driving out here on the freeway and just thinking about how good God is, and suddenly, and I advise you to keep your eyes open when you do this. But while they have their eyes open, they're just praising the Lord the worship begins to well up in their spirit and they begin to pray or sing in a language they don't know anything about. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14, 15, Paul says, what is it? The two ways to pray. See, I want to make something very clear to you. I believe that tongues are not only for a sign to the unbeliever, but they're to praise God with. They're one of the ways to pray in the spirit. And isn't it wonderful to pray in the spirit Romans 8 says, We don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself maketh intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. And so we worship the Lord. We praise the Lord from our spirit. And God receives that praise. So here in this wonderful, beautiful chapter, Simon offered money, but he couldn't get the Holy Spirit or get that power to pray with people that way. Now the ninth chapter tells about Saul of Tarsus receiving. And this is a marvelous chapter where Ananias, a layman, prayed for him. You know, some people say, well, it was only for the apostles. Let me say, friends, it was a layman by the name of Ananias that did the praying. God gave the Holy Spirit to hungry hearts, and he's still doing the same thing. Let's go to Acts 10 now, the 10th chapter. 44th verse says, While Peter yet spake the word, while he was preaching his sermon, Holy Spirit fell on them that heard the word. And they had the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also poured out the Holy Ghost. How did he know? 
for he heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And he said, can any man forbid water baptism? In this setting, the water baptism followed after the baptism of Jesus. How many of you know what the baptism of Jesus is? See, the baptism of Jesus, see, I can baptize you in water. Who's the baptizer when I baptize in water? In a little bit, I'm going to baptize in water. I'm the baptizer. What is the element? The element is water. Well, now, when you receive the baptism in the Spirit, who's the baptizer? Everybody shout it loud. Jesus. And what is the element? The Holy Spirit. What, who is the candidate? You. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit, aren't you? So Jesus puts you down into the Holy Spirit, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, aren't you? And you come up rejoicing in the Spirit, just like when you're baptized in water. Well, Peter, while he yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. And the way he knew it was for he heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And he said, Can any man forbid water baptism? In the 11th chapter, he used that same thing. He said, as it happened to us at the beginning, it's so important for you to know your roots and to know where this great Pentecostal movement started. That's why we've told the story about Azusa. You need to know where it all happened. God is still, still doing the same thing. And I suppose in this age when we've seen so many people of every denomination, there's not a single church of any denomination in Orange County that hasn't been affected by the Holy Spirit movement. It has reached in every, every nook and every corner. I remember one Presbyterian pastor in the area preached on, have you had your glossolalia today? <laughs> you know why? Because so many of them had had their glossolalia. What am I talking about? The speaking with tongues, the worship in the Spirit. And they were so intoxicated on the Lord. They were so filled with the Spirit. How many of you believe the Holy Spirit can fall on us today? Acts 10, 4, for he said while he was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell. Now let's go to the last verse, Acts chapter 19. This is 22 years after Pentecost. Paul went down and said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, we haven't heard. He said, well, what about your baptism? It was the baptism of John, baptism of repentance. Then he preached Jesus and they were baptized. Now, I think it's imperative you know that you can't receive the Holy Spirit until you're converted. You have to be baptized in Jesus. See, there's a baptism. There are many baptisms. Some people say, well, there's one baptism. Yes, that Scripture says that, but it's not talking about this because in Hebrews it says, now concerning the doctrine of baptisms, and I could name seven baptisms. So it says here concerning this, John's baptism, the baptism of Jesus, and the baptism in water. John baptized them in water. Then he laid his hands upon them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So I think there are three scriptural ways. The first way is that spontaneously it can happen. While you're hearing this word, your faith can reach out and receive the promise of the Father. Secondly, hands can be laid upon you. Now, I don't even think that we have to lay hands on you. I think you could take your own hands and put your hands on your head, and you could receive the Holy Spirit. Just think about your hands becoming the hands of Jesus. Look at your hands. Everybody look at your hands. You know, that's a marvelous thing, the hand God has given. And you'll see a lot in the Old Testament about laying on of hands. Well, you know these hands, when they become the hands of Jesus, they're pretty great. If Jesus put his hands on you, would you receive? How many of you believe you'd receive if the Lord's hands were put on you? Well, when we pray in the name of the Lord and you put that hand on there, it's not the man that does it, it's Jesus who does it because he's the baptizer. And when you have hands laid upon you, three out of the five places hands were laid on them and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. How did they know it? Because they spoke with tongues and prophesied. See, I think there are two things happen there. A lot of people emphasize only the speaking in tongues, but I believe one of the other evidences is prophesying our joy, their power to witness, do the works of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a person, 
and you're going to develop a relationship, a friendship with this person, the Holy Spirit. He's coming through to fill you with power and glory. So God wants the Holy Spirit to come. You see, I see this thing happening in Catholic churches, in Catholic parishes, and I see it happening in Baptist churches. You heard it right here where a Baptist preacher was preaching this. It's happening in every denomination. Why? Because God said, I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Come on. Come on. You say, oh, I don't want to do that. Sure you do. You're hungry. Look at him running. Oh, you're anxious. Before you call, I will answer, God said. There she's receiving it already. Oh, hallelujah. Before you call, I will fill you. Receive the power of God. Before you call, God says, I'll do it. Receive the promise of the Father in the name of Jesus. Praise God. In the name of the Lord. Put them single file over here. In the name of Jesus, brother. In the name of Jesus, the power of God's on you. Lady, the power of God's on you right now. In the name of the Lord, when I touch you, the power of God will hit you. Receive now in the name of the Lord. Sir, in the name of Jesus, receive. Receive now. Go on, open your mouth, begin to pray in it. Act of your will. Let it come way down here. Come on, open your mouth. No language you know. In the name of Jesus, receive the promise of the Father. Pray aloud. I can't hear you. Now you're beginning to receive. Come on. That's right. Go on. Enter in, sister. In the name of Jesus, let it come deep out of your spirit. Deep out of your spirit. When I put my hand upon you, expect to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, in the name of Jesus. Now, in the name of Jesus. Receive it. Hallelujah. Receive the promise of the Father. Receive the promise of the Father. Receive the promise of the Father. Go on. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Everybody say praise the Lord. Worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and praise him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Receive it now. Great. No one can do it. Speak it up. 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 That's it. I love 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 it. I have a word for you. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has told me that you too are going to be used greatly of the Lord. You walk very carefully before God. And your life will be a blessing to many others. And God will use you as a witness to many nations. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Receive. Praise God. Receive power. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can be filled if you'll do what God tells you to do. Thank you. Something we're entertaining. I'll tell you right now, they've never had anything like this in Melody Land before. I'll tell you that. <laughs> You are viewing the live, uncut, full service of the late Catherine Kuhlman, taped at Melody Land in 1969. This two-hour video plus one-hour documentary is a $100 value. But if you order today, we'll include an additional $40 gift of six hours of audio tape by Miss Kuhlman. Send your $100 check today.